Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana White, and this is the second of five so far uh, sessions with Dr. Dennis Slattery called Writing Myth, Bridging Mythology and Art. And I'm going to turn it over to my good friend and colleague and co-host, uh, Dr. Will Lynn. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Great to be here with everybody tonight. Um, we had a nice long intro last time, and since we're continuing where we left off this time, uh, would love for us to just jump right back in. Uh, so you guys remember Dara, who's author of Inside Story and a Script Consultant, uh, and um, uh, Kwame, who is the founder of Alchemy Inc., who received a major award in the last week. Congratulations. Uh, John is a writer and author of Master of the Cinematic Universe. Uh, you know me, I chair the general education department at Hushin, formerly Studio School. Uh, and uh, Dana, of course, and all of us are mythologists and all of us uh, have been students of Dennis. Uh, honored to be here tonight. Thank you, Dennis, and looking forward to your talk on uh, Dante. Well, thank you all, the panelists, for being here again. I know it's a, it's a, uh, it's a sacrifice. It's uh, fitting it into schedules that, uh, if you're like me, you're finding yourself busier than ever uh, during this uh, virus. So I can't express my gratitude uh, strongly enough to uh, each and every one of you. And thank you all participants uh, for being here as well. So the, um, the most important thing for me in these five uh, classes is to make this material uh, that's presented an occasion for self-reflection on one's own personal myth. That's what I wanna return to um, again and again. And just um, so, as, uh, so that I don't assume, um, and we all have our own understandings of what a myth is as well, I'd like to read just a little bit, because uh, in all of my writing, and I, and I, like so many of you, like to come on others who have written about myth and cite them, but I'm at a place in my professional and personal life where I'm trying to figure it out for myself, uh, having read uh, a good bit on myth over the years. So let me share a few things from uh, a chapter in here on a previous book entitled From War to Wonder, uh, Retrieving Your Personal Myth Through Homer's Odyssey. First, and these are bullet points uh, in the book, a myth is that element or quality that holds our life in a complex network of coherences, conflicts, and contradictions. Next, not to know the contours of our own myth can leave deep gaps in our identity and continued confusion where there may exist an underlying unity and an underlying clarity. Next, a myth gives our life purpose and meaning a mythless life is a life without meaning, and in some cases, without value, because it's not recognized, or maybe even worse, it's not appreciated. Next, to begin to grasp our personal myth, we can reflectively ask a couple of really basic questions. One, who am I? Two, where am I headed? Three, what is my real passion in life? These are mythological questions and perhaps spiritual questions as well. Next point, and I wrote these purposely in, in brief um, points uh, for reflection. And you know we could we could spend the entire uh, time together uh, unpacking these a bit, but I just want to get I want to frame uh, each of the classes that I do the the second one three four and five 
by stating some explicit things of what I think a myth is. The beliefs that we hold dear help to concentrate our mythic selves into a unity while not denying where diversity, otherness, and patterns of continued growth are operating. So it's, it's, it's two-faced. It's, it's um, not a dichotomy, it's a, it's a duality within unity. And that's part of, part of the paradox for me of what myths consist of, both personal and collective. Next point. I'm gonna hunch up here a little bit to get by the light. A myth is what we continually call on to create a functional relationship with the external world that we move through daily. So we call on our myths as one of the sources, and here I'm thinking of Will's interest and others in here, you're all immensely creative people. But we call on that creativity through the myth we're living, I think, um, that we move through daily, as well as the interior terrain that comprises who and what we are and are becoming. So we're both being and becoming simultaneously. And that's part of our mythic dimension. A myth reveals to us our reference points in life. These reference points can be understood as our reverence points as well. What we reverence, we reference. And if we flipped it and suggested what we reference, we reverence. Especially in times of hardship, loss, confusion, which I know I and I've had many listening are feeling today. A myth is always busy constructing a model of reality, a guiding set of values and twistings of the normative as we live into and become curious about new territories in our life and how they may fit the larger patterns that identify us. And the last one in this series of bullet points, but I'm gonna continue on just a little further. A myth reveals that what I believe about myself and the world influence what I believe to be true and what I believe to be false. Let me read that again. A myth reveals what I believe about myself so myths are beliefs and the world and the world what i believe about myself and the world will influence what i believe to be true and what i believe to be false and then this short uh, addition <clears throat> a friend of mine in akron ohio a former miss student has developed a nonprofit organization uh, working with young black youths in that city and in Copley, Ohio. He calls it Alchemy Inc. I have gone to his gatherings <clears throat> three times over the many years to work with Kwame Scruggs and his young men. At one of the gatherings, he posed to them this question, and this has, uh, Kwame, this has stayed with me uh, over the years. I just thought it was profound. He posed to the young men, <clears throat> what are the two most important days in your life? He lets them play with possible responses, possible answers. A couple of the young men rightly responded that it was the day they were born. Kwame's answers are below. They got, ha they got half of it. The day that I was born was one of the two most important days in my life. But here's the profundity that I think is so mythically inflected that Kwame uh, posed to them uh, next. The second day is the day you discover why. And I reflect on this. The first question touches on matters of biology. 
the second on matters of mythology. Our personal myths push us to ask why we are here and what we have decided to serve during this precious time that we are here. But one must be awake to hear both of these uh, questions. And the last point I'll say about personal myth at this point, <clears throat> our personal myth is also the energy and the template we use to transform, because myths are transformative, that we use to transform the multiple events that happen to us daily with at first glance seemingly, seeming to have little relation to one another into a coherent story. So for me, one of the most powerful energies about mythology is that they move us towards a sense of coherence by taking all of these bits and shards and pieces that comprise any one of our days and form them, shape them, and, and will and others. This is where the art comes in that runs right up against myth because it creates them into a coherent narrative. Okay, so I wanted to, I wanted to start with that <clears throat> as a kind of introduction. <clears throat> and now I'm gonna uh, offer some prefatory remarks before we look at some passages um, and some sonnets that Dante composes in his La Vida Nuova, which is, uh, I've had so much fun with this in the last couple of weeks. What I'm realizing about La Vida Nuova is it's a record and a memory <clears throat> of how Dante comes to understand the mythology that gives his life purpose. And the second step of it will be to write the Divine Comedy uh, several years after. So let me say a few things about La Vida Nuova, the new life, which as I read and reread uh, sections of it, realized that for a new life to begin, something of the old life must die off. And the question becomes for every one of us, what are you willing to let die off? so that parts of a new life can begin to take shape and to take form. And that I think is one of the implicit questions that Dante poses in the early part where there is little to be read. There comes a chapter with the rubric, Incipit Via Nuova. The new life begins. It's my intention, he writes, to copy into this little book, which is comprised of 31 sonnets, the words I find written under that heading, if not all of them, at least the essence uh, of their meaning. See, it's a, it's a book in which he discovers that his life work is to be a poet and to give voice to what has been invisibly present, but hasn't had a form uh, developed by means of it. So he starts it uh, uh, in memory, which I think is where myths originate. I think they originate in the memory. And to remember can be a mythological activity that takes us on that journey closer to who we are. So he takes up poems that he has written and he organizes them, giving them a form and a coherence. So like all of us, there are two Dantes. There's the Dante of now reflecting on the Dante of then. And so the then of Dante's early years is given shape through the now that Dante reminisces about and begins to understand for the first time. I've all, as I grew up, I was always fascinated by why older people, and I'm, I don't consider myself one of them just yet, uh, are always remembering and talking about the past. What's going on? Have they given up? Is there no life in front? But <laughs> reflecting on it, maybe from a little bit more of a ripening on the vine of life, 
I realize that they're seeking the form of their history and a coherence to it. And what better way to approach that is to remember your stories and tell them. And in each telling, as we age, um, it's kind of interesting how the earliest parts of our life start to take on shape, not what happened uh, 12 years ago, because they're seeing the form of their lives mythologically. And I think it's a built in it, built in an innate impulse in us to mythologize ourselves. And one of the most powerful ways to do that is to remember and to remember with others. And especially to remember, which is why it's so wonderful to have friends that have been in our lives for 35 years, 40 years, 50 years. Uh, I know when my brother, brothers and sister, when we're on the phone, we're always remembering stuff from our childhood. And we're recollecting our myths by means of them. So we cannot separate the act of remembering from that of mythologizing. This is what Dante's La Vida Nuova has shown me in a way that I didn't see before uh, when I was teaching parts of it. So the translator, I chose Mark Muse's uh, translation. He's also translated the entirety of the Divine Comedy and decided for himself he wasn't going to try to do the rhyme scheme the Terza Rima rhyme scheme of the Divine Comedy. He said, no, it's too much, and I'm not sure that English uh, can handle it. Uh, but his translation is one of the best out there. He tells us in an intro that Dante wants to recall those past experiences which bear so forcefully on his meeting with Beatrice Portinati. And he meets Beatrice for the first time when both of them are nine years of age. He's writing La Vida Nuova when he's 29. So 20, two decades have passed before he turns to mythologize his history. So I want to, I'm going to put that out there for now, and maybe one of you comes back to it, that the power of um, remembrance is in its ability to mythologize our history. And some, most of it's true, some of it's made up, but does it matter? And I'll tell you who has written about this profoundly is um, Tim O'Brien in the, um, oh, the Things They Carried, which is his experiences in Vietnam. He's my age. In fact, he lives uh, 50 miles north of me in Austin, Texas. And um, uh, Ken Burns used him often in creating the uh, uh, eight-part uh, history of Vietnam, the documentary. And when I finished his book, I went back and typed up all the places in it in which he spoke about the nature of story. And one of the one of the things that he uh, disabused me of. Is to, is to believe that all stories actually happened. In fact, he claims that some of the best stories in our lives never happened except in the moment that we're making them up. So that's that fictional mythic quality of, our, of each of our narratives. And I find it fascinating uh, to think about they didn't have to happen in history to be true. In fact, he claims some of the best, truest stories that he heard from other uh, vets never happened. There, when he meets Beatrice, he intuits his new life beginning. And this is something that I think happens to each of us in various degrees. And... Uh, more than once, perhaps, in our lives, that some event turns us. John, I remember your comment uh, last week, and you were so um, uh, enraptured with the underworld course, I think, that Lance taught, and you said, it transformed me. It changed my life. See, that's La Vida Nuova. That's a form of La Vida Nuova. 
she, Beatrice, along with, this is Dante's language, the Lord of Love, capital L, capital L, the Lord of Love, and Dante comprise this trinity that guides the entire La Vida Nuova, Beatrice, Dante, and the Lord of Love. And we're going to look at uh, a couple of passages uh, that I'm going to read you. So that Beatrice becomes a figure in Dante's life who is both mythic, metaphorical, and material at once. There's a tendency in Dante's scholarship to symbolize Beatrice almost out of existence. And one of my fine Miss students, Colleen Harris, defended her dissertation maybe six months ago on the body of Beatrice, where she gave a feminist depth psychological reading of Beatrice in, in, the, in the service of retrieving Beatrice's embodiment from being abstracted into a symbol. Yeah, a, a, a beautiful work. She is mythic, metaphorical, and material at once, capturing something in her being that is at the heart of a life's essential purpose. Uh, I, I want to lean on this idea that meeting her at nine years of old, uh, nine years of age, and then reflecting on her two decades later gives his life purpose. I think we all have a Beatrice event, a Beatrice figure, um, uh, a Beatrice illness, something major that shifts the properties of what we think our existence is comprised of. Uh, yeah, so we can say more about that in a bit. So he meets her when she is nine, and he is nine. That makes it the year 1274. And I should have said to you, all of you before this <clears throat> that Dante's years are 1265 to 1321. <clears throat> and most scholars agree that he finished the Divine Comedy, Paradiso, um, around 1317 or 1318. After meeting her, and I'm giving a large overview, and then we'll look at some of the specifics, but I want you to see how the plot trajectory operates. <clears throat> After meeting her, he returns to his room in a kind of ecstasy to contemplate her. He knows that his life is changed in ways that he cannot comprehend. He knows something historical and mythic has occurred to him, but he can't find the language to articulate it. So the La Vida Nuova begins to take shape when Dante is between 28 and 30, that is between 1294 and 95. I'm just trying to make sure that we have a historical context to thinking about this mythological event that transforms him and then pushes him forward. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, but pushes him forward to realize that the vessel of these 31 sonnets is completely inadequate to capture the nature of love itself in its permutations. And so it's at the end of this poem, He's very much like Stephen Dedalus at the end of Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Now he's going to leave Ireland to do his work as a high priest of the imagination. That's Joyce's language. It's Stephen Dedalus's language. And the end of La Vida Nuova is the, uh, carries a, uh, uh, the last sonnet, which is the only one in future tense. And that's where he conceives of the idea of writing this 14,200 and some odd lines that will be the Divine Comedy. So he looks back at this point in what I call a memorial meditation to weld, to weld the poems he has written along with prose that outlines the poem's meanings. And it was not unusual in the Middle Ages for a poet 
to write his or her poem and then say, here's what I was up to. Here's what I was intending to do. And we as readers do not have to buy into that uh, exclusively or, or unconditionally. We have our own reading that we can add to that. So La Vida Nuova, like the Divine Comedy, is a witness to how we live two lives, the now of our present circumstances, always in dialogue with the then of our previous life, which we can see more clearly. And by that I mean see the myth that has been guiding it from the now of our consciousness. I think that this dual seeing and understanding puts him in touch with the fundamental mystery of who he is. Ah, maybe I'm pushing here, but perhaps the fundamental mystery of being itself. So it's ontological as well as poetic and mythological. You know, the line between myth and metaphysics, I, as I think about it more and more, I think is thinner and thinner and thinner. This being put in touch with the fundamental mystery of being, which is also, I think, what myths, as Campbell says, point us towards. They're, the finger is not the moon. But if we can see the finger to what it's pointing to, it's what can't be grasped. It's, what, it, it's, what's, um, it's what's numinous. It's what's luminous, which really fits in with Dante's pilgrimage. Because at the end of the Divine Comedy in Paradiso 33, he says, you know, I've really blown it. I have failed. I never found the right language to give expression to the fullness of love, capital L. Well. Let me fail like that. I mean, that's really terrific. He saw himself, I didn't pull it off. Well, history has told him that maybe you did better than you think you did. So this moment with Beatrice leaves him confused and disoriented. So again, this Beatrician moment, which is, which is I think, a mythic moment, you might ask yourself, when in my life have I found myself suddenly disoriented, confused, uh, topsy-turvy. Uh, where did that come from that threw all of my best laid plans out? Uh, this is, I felt secure, I felt comfortable, this is gonna work, and then wham, something disorients us and throws us out. That's the Beatrician moment that I'm trying to work through this literal moment, but for all of us, it's a mythic. Uh, moment as well. Once he begins to write the poetry in La Vida Nuova, he begins to move to insight and illumination. See, there's something, and you all know this, <clears throat> there's something about the mystery of language that when we put pen to paper or we start uh, uh, composing uh, on, the, on, the, on the computer, on the screen, Something enters that experience. Uh, another voice, a psyche, uh, the collective unconscious, your own personal unconscious, and begins to feed that topic, that understanding, that angle of vision. That's where our myth resides, I believe. But the deeper mystery is that love, and I'm, I'm keep saying capital L, itself, Dante comes to the realization that love itself is a way of knowing. Love itself is a way of knowing. And there's one sonnet in which he de dedicates, or actually begins, um, about intelletto de amore, the intelligence of love. It has its own intellect, so it's not split. It's not an emotion split from thought or reason. It's a way of being thoughtful or reasonable. At one point in love's visitation, 
love speaks to Dante and says this, I am like the center of a circle, equidistant from all points on the circumference, but you, Dante, are not. Well, he's giving him, he's giving him a, um, a, a life plan, if you will. And Dante ends, if I can just make this connection between these early pages of La Vida Nuova, <clears throat> done in, the, in Paradiso 33, the last, the, the hundredth canto of the Divine Comedy, that's Dante's uh, explicit description of what God is. And that's an old, ancient image of God being the center whose circumference is nowhere and whose center is everywhere. So in the first pages of La Vida Nuova are the last lines of the Divine Comedy. So it really does create a magnificent uh, mandala of an understanding that comes out of love. <clears throat> Journeying, or I prefer the term pilgrimaging, towards the center is also a part of his life's work and culminates in the last canto of the Paradiso when he contemplates three circles tied with each, within each other with an image of a mortal in the center. I want to suggest, and I have already, but I'm underscoring it, that such a journey is shared to some degree by every one of us. To become who we are destined to be is a way of centering ourselves in the world. So by, by becoming who we are, we become centered in the world, not only in the world that we inhabit, but I think in a broader balanced perspective that takes in the entire world. I remember this reading for the first time that stirring essay by Jung, Christ as a symbol of the self. And Beatrice carries this uh, presence of Christ uh, throughout La Vida Nuova and of course through the Paradiso. It's a way of grasping the figure of Christ as a symbolic image for life's guidance. The Levita Nuova then is a spiritual odyssey, a pilgrimage to the soul of the self, and that's in large measure why I wanted to explore it with you in this second class. What Beatrician moment has guided your life up to today? When did you discover the basic fundamental theme of your life that you continue to cultivate variations on? So like myths being thematic, I think each of our lives carries one or a few themes that we continually to play variations on. To me, that is a sign that, that the myth we're living is still organic and hasn't calcified into some kind of ideology or fixed position where there's no room to grow. A growth stops. Here's another. What narrative guides you on a daily basis? The plot of which you remember and you rehearse frequently, repeatedly, maybe many times any given day, that narrative comes back to you. And what you're doing at the moment um, uh, echoes, resonates, is in conflict with that prevailing narrative that you return to. And then I'm also thinking about the dream life, because one of the most poignant moments in La Vida Nuova is a dream that Dante has. So here's the question I pose. What dream has had a powerful influence on you? Perhaps it's a dream that recurs periodically or that stays in your memory and perhaps for years. Another way of thinking about myth is to ask, what is your guiding metaphor? That is, what figure or condition or situation is a North Star for you. 
It's your, it's your guiding principle. Another, what work has provided you with a purpose, a meaning, and a direction? What's, what is your work? Are you still seeking it? Uh, have you found it? Is it um, mutating into other formats? And believe me, I ask myself these questions um, uh, often. And the answer always shifts just a bit, some of them becoming more firm. What in your current frontier, that is, what horizon do you continue to work toward? We are seeking in these questions what Dante sought, but, not, but did not directly know until it happened. With Beatrice, he finds his myth. He finds the door that opens him to the symbolic life and to the realm of poetic life into the realm, I would add, of the invisibles, and into the world of his own unconscious. For Jung, myths reveal, this is a quote, myths reveal the nature of the soul. That's what we might seek here. So Jung believes that myths reveal the nature of the soul. I think poets have been doing that for millennia, as well, so that the divine comedy will be Dante's mythopoetic continuation for his soul and for the soul of the world, the anima mundi, the realm of both spirit and flesh. I feel like there's a lot on the table and maybe some articulation of a few points uh, might be in order right now. So let me. Let me pause and um, uh, just check in with the panel and then check in with the participants uh, as well. I, I uh, Dennis, am really moved by uh, this idea of a Beatrice moment. And I, I'm wondering if you see any, um, any rhythm to the Beatrice moments that we experience mm -hmm. in our life or if they they seem you know random, um, I, I just wonder if you if you've had any observations about the the, the natural rhythm of those Beatrice moments. Yeah, that's great. Um, confusion, no surprise. Dante at nine is blown away by the presence of this young woman on one of the bridges in Florence. Uh, confusion, disorientation, a sense of meditation, and I don't, I don't mean to sound clinical here, but John, you're, I mean, I, I, I think I do see something and I didn't maybe realize that I did. Then in the, in the articulation, there'll be a moment that we'll look at when Dante says, I don't know why, and I've never written a poem, but I feel compelled that the vehicle to try to capture what I've experienced has to come through a poetic, creative moment. This is where myth becomes art. And then the, mm, the poem becomes a witness to that confusion. And in the process, clarifies something. It doesn't explain it. I hope that makes uh, sense to you guys that it's not explanation, but there is some clarifying, some illuminating that takes place. And then he feels compelled to share it with others to get their response. So it goes from the private, intimate, exhilarating, uh, sexual, to a form that he can share with others. So yeah, now, does that paradigm work for you all? I mean, work for any of you at, that are present in this uh, class. And I'm sure there's places to add or, well, it doesn't happen to me quite that way, but maybe I'm beginning to see some template in which it does work. And I think that context is also essential 
for our personal mythologies. I think our personal myths are some amalgam of content and context. And knowing the context of which, in which we have these experiences is at least as important as the content that erupts by means of them. So thanks for that, John. Yeah, others. Uh, Dennis, thank you. This is uh, so um, wonderful to go down this road with you. Uh, I was so fortunate to have taken your Dante course, and it yes. was absolutely transformative. Um, thank you. I, I took it the final semester I was at Pacifica, and it was as if all the pieces just click, click, clicked into place, and it, it was it was amazing. Um, and um, we didn't thank really. Talk about this book, so I'm I'm no. I'm very much enjoying adding this to to uh, the other work because I think Dante Good. needs a guide. <laughs> no pun intended here, but no. I think it's very very <laughs> difficult to study this on your own, and we really uh, we really need some guidance. And I find so much of his metaphor of the work so metaphorically relevant in um, life and perspective and and everything, and it's. It's absolutely shaded so much of my work. So I just wanted to say that. Um, you, you. Said, you said something at the top, and I don't want to misquote you, because I, 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 no. I know it's a little scant here. No, but I can return you to said it. said something at the beginning about um, a reference to a life without myth. Can, can you? Yeah, in, uh, I think I was pulling I think I was pulling from uh, an obscure order. I think that's page 80. I can just read that. Well, I, yeah, I, 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 just, I can just jump to my question here. Good. Uh, Good. Because I'm wondering what that is. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, every life is in storied. I mean, from any moment of consciousness, yeah. we, we are enveloped in a story and our early narrative has to do, of course, with the family of origin and the stories, uh, whatever, whatever that evokes. But I don't know how we can be uninstoried, <laughs> you know, I, how, how a life can not, I mean, it, it might be slim pickings. <laughs> it might be, um, uh, uh, something, it, it might be perverse. Okay, but yes. there are, there is a quality to it that I think we have. I, I feel like we need to recognize that it um, because I think that's one of the things we contend with all the time is yep. that um, we tend to see the world through our own narrative and and have have a a, 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 a lack of understanding that so does everybody else, you know, mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think if 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 we can can be more sensitive to the uh, just to the fact that there is another narrative that that you know because oftentimes of course the friends and associations and things we make we have a lot we have a lot of elements of sharing a narrative perspective so that yeah. um, uh, we're we're moving through and 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 have similarities and and so on so we can discuss that. But I think this is what leads to a lot of othering when we don't have an ability to see that 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 you know there is there is another there are, I don't know there there's there's another there's another narrative there's another um, yes. mythic, right? so so the idea that that someone can cannot have a myth I didn't quite get that yeah. Well, I, I think I was playing with the notion that um, myths fundamentally give our lives meaning. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems that a, a, a life without meaning or a life without purpose is a life without a, 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 a myth that's maybe conscious. Mm -hmm. I mean, the myth could be there. And I'm just, I'm just not yet equipped or ready to see the story that I'm in. Yeah. Now that that might be a way of thinking about how, well, my life seems to be without purpose, but on reflection, and see that's an end with a, a huge dose of empathy for ourselves, mm -hmm. if not for others, I think we can get into a dark place. 
and feel like this is all really kind of meaningless. Mm -hmm. It doesn't add up to anything for me. Mm -hmm. I can add to that. But I think please. There's another scenario where no. I, I think, or I wonder if you agree with this, where the ego is trying to live a different narrative yes. than what the person's real myth is. Yes. And I think it can create, well, yeah, I wonder what you think about that. I would, I would say that that is part of Campbell's lexicon, which he calls mythic disassociation. That's his language, where we're living a split life. Yeah, and, and part of my narrative is determined to go this way. But the, but, the, but the heart's calling, if I can use that language, but the heart's calling is going over here. And so, you know, which one do we feed most often that gathers the most energy? So to, to live that split narrative, absolutely. And Campbell was, he was, he, he was insightful about that and, and giving it a term where we're mythically disassociated from ourselves or I'm whole within myself, but I'm mythically disassociated from the culture's myth. I, I, I just can't buy into it. Uh, and may I just, uh, th this isn't a plug, but I brought this because I'm reading it. Uh, I, I'm just, and it, it's a Pulitzer Prize winner. It's called The End of the Myth. And here's the subtitle, From the Frontier to the Border Wall in the Mind of America. Uh, Greg Grandin won the Pulitzer for it. It's just remarkable. It's a history of the American mythology that oppressed, uh, stole, uh, crushed uh, under the myth of expansion and exceptionalism. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a dynamite book and I want you all to know that it exists. And I'm not sure I'm on, I don't know, page uh, 50. I, I don't know if he's used the word myth yet. He's giving us history. But as we read it, who have some grasp uh, of myth, we, we hear the myth coming through the history. So anyhow, uh, thank you for the uh, uh, Corridor Inn to give his book uh, a plug. So th those are a couple of responses, Will, but I'm also interested in, in any others that uh, the panel might make. These are, really, these are really helpful for me because they help me understand how I'm coming across mm -hmm. by what you see and what you take and push further, which is for me, the juice of learning itself. I mean, well, you, you know, say that, however, you give such rich material, it's hard not to bring a lot of ourselves to it. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you for that. that that's that. If, if, if I do that, because I can't prove any of this and I'm too old to give a damn about trying. But if it evokes in you, the part, uh, panel, participants, it takes you somewhere, success from my vantage point. So thank you for that. And please, I'm, I'm talking too much. Let's, let's go for a few more minutes and then let me pick it back up, if that's okay. Uh, Dennis? Please. It seems to me when you and talk about the association between myth and meaning, it seems to me that we really cannot discover meaning except in the past or imagining it forward in the future by chasing it. That when we're actively engaged in our myth or in our behavior or doing whatever it is that we're doing, the idea of meaning is sort of a phantom. It lurks out there over the horizons. It lurks in, in other places but we can't directly access it because meaning to me just only appears upon reflection and we can't really reflect okay. in the present moment except upon something that's not in the present moment. We have to draw in some, 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 something from the past or we imagine forward in the future, but it's inaccessible in the present moment. Mm -hmm. uh, does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, it does because I th I think that you know I'm I'm I remember maybe Hillman quoting Plotinus, uh, the Enneads. I've never 
understood the pronunciation, E-N-N-E-A-D-S, a magnificent uh, mystical spiritual uh, text in which Plotinus says, all learning takes place by likeness. And Jung, uh, analogy formation is a law which to a large extent governs the psyche. So there's exactly, I mean, you're making me think about it a little bit differently than I have. So that in the present, there can be those moments of uh, uh, analogical discovery. Hey, what I'm hearing here takes me back to when I was 13 because I had something similar happen to me. So this is a beautiful moment when the presentness of our life <clears throat> uh, implicates, uh, captures or nets something in our past and some something coheres at that moment that can be illuminating. I mean, uh, this is, I mean, you've, you've taken us right back into La Vida Nuova in that comment, because that, I think that's one of the great discoveries that Dante makes, but I think it's a discovery that all of us come to at some point, that my past is my future, and my, my future is my present, and then this linear notion of past, present, future begins, for me, <laughs> begins to collapse into a kind of um, imaginal realm in which they're all present simultaneously. I, mean, I, I, saw, I saw Kwame trying to come in twice, so oh, I'm no, going to stop. Kwame, <laughs> please. No, I, please, do you, you, yeah, one, we want to hear. Okay, uh, when, when Dara was talking about uh, uh, not really having a myth or everybody having a myth or, no. or, or like living mythically, it wasn't until I was 30 some years old, 31, 32, that I, that I understood that, that I had a purpose in life. And it was interesting because uh, I was working full time, going to school in the evening, part time for like 15 years. So I was, so it was like some invisible that was leading me somewhere, but I had no idea what it was. I knew I was doing the right thing, but it wasn't until I went through that formal, you know, initiation of rites of passage that I was introduced to African spirituality and you Campbell that I understood uh, what my purpose for living was and that's when I started to live mythically but prior to that even though and I and I definitely understand what you're saying there but but prior to that it, it was just lying dormant it was lying dormant yes. and then and then John when you asked about the Beatrice moment first thing that came to my mind uh, I think it was you who said talking about alchemy he said the the stone will be found when the search lies heavy on the searcher and then I, then I remember taking your class, then it's epic imagination, and you said, leap in the, leap in the net shall appear, okay? But you, but, but you have to leap first. You've got to leap first. Yeah, I think, I think once we start to search, and then I think that's when Beatrice, you know, comes into our life. It's like when the student is ready, the teacher shall appear. And hey, Dennis, one other thing, one other thing, and then I'm done. You're, you, were, you were talking about the uh, being with the youth and the two important days, your two, two most important moments in your life, the day you were born and the day you found out why. That was Mark Twain. I wish I could say that was me. All right, but it's Mark Twain. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, it, was, it was the first time I ever heard it. So for me, it's, it's Kwame. But I get, you, I get the point. <laughs> no, it was, it was profound. I sat there thinking, holy crap, this, this was, this, that was worth coming, working with you, working with the, with the youth. Uh, it galvanized something uh, for me. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, it's like a catalytic converter <laughs> that we have a moment where one day, one moment we're this way, and the next moment we're something else. And the threshold, the crossover, but it can happen, not but, and it can happen in an instant. Yeah, it's, it's just one of the most miraculous things about being human that that's possible. Dennis, I would Please. like to take a moment and we have a special guest in our participants. Oh. Uh, Connie Zweig is here. Beautiful, and Connie. I'd like to say hello and then she yes. ask you a question. <clears throat> Thanks, Dana. Oh, Connie, g glad to hear your voice. Dennis, this really touched me. I want to share something very personal. Um, just because this brought tears to my eyes and I'm compelled to share it. 
Um, so when I was nine years old, I saw a boy. His name was Steve Riker. And that boy aroused a longing in me, a yearning that didn't go away. He was the object of my longing for from the time I was nine until I was 19. And, you know, there were moments when we connected, but it wasn't about that. He became um, my Imago Dei. Yeah. And my parents thought I was so crazy, they put me in therapy. Mm. But, the, you know, because so young <laughs> to be that attached to a boy. But what happened was when I was 19, I learned how to meditate and that longing got moved onto the divine. It was the same yearning. It was the same internal experience, but the object, its object moved from Steve to God and my spiritual life began. And as I meditated over the next decades, and then I found Goethe's poem, Holy Longing. And I recognized the connection between them. And it became, and I would say, you know, we're talking about, do we know we're living a myth? Are we all living a myth? Are we conscious of living a myth? I mean, I think that most people are not conscious of it. And somehow this was given to me. And it was like a fate to know that I was living this story of spiritual longing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually I wrote a book, um, Meeting the Shadow of Spirituality, which is about Holy Long. Actually, first my, my dissertation at Pacifica was called The Holy Longing. Oh. And I looked at spiritual yearning in all of the frames of psychology and all the different psychological schools. And I remember talking about Dante and Beatrice in there. Um, I'm not very literary, so I don't, I didn't know it as well as you just described it. But this has been my myth. And, yeah. and you know, today I think I would call it the myth of awakening because what i recognize is that the object of the longing can change and it evolves just as jung talked about how the imago day evolves and and so i really really i rarely share this story but i wanted mm. to share it because you, you you just touched me so deeply it's such a beautiful story and i i want to um I want to respond to it, and I'll be, and I'll be brief, because I, I want to leave space for others of you. It is so, it, it's so much a pattern of the divine comedy, Connie, what you said, because when Dante meets Beatrice for the first time, I think it's, I think it's Canto 30 of Purgatorio, and Dante is carrying the fantasy or the memory of the love that he felt for Beatrice and thinks he's going to pick that yearning back up now at the top of Mount Purgatory in the Garden of Eden. And Beatrice cuts him no slack and really um, she beats him up a bit emotionally to, uh, and your story is helping me understand it uh, better than I have in the past. He's shocked as if, as if she slapped him in the face because he was, he was carrying the yearning for her and she knew that it was to be directed towards the primal love that moves the sun and the other stars. That's Dante's language, that's what God is. It's the one, it's the presence of the movement that everything's in harmony if we can back up enough to see it. So the yearning, the yearning uh, Beatrice did not want to step on 
but she wanted to redirect it. And I'm thinking of your language about that's when you felt your spiritual life maybe was, you know, the, the new life, your, your Vita Nuova. And that's, that's exactly what happens to Dante. Then he's on a completely different plane of relationship with her. And she is his, she is his spiritual guide uh, right to the, one of the last cantos of uh, Paradiso. So Connie, thank you for that personal story because it, it, it fits beautifully within the, uh, the pattern, the mythic pattern that uh, takes Dante to the end of uh, uh, the Divine Comedy. Yeah. I have dedicated all my books to that boy. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Thank oh, you, my Dennis. Gosh. Thank oh, you beautiful. so much. My pleasure. Thanks. Any other participants uh, like to speak at this point? Yes, I have one more. Um, oh, good. Yeah. Uh, Sheila. Yeah, um, I'm going to sleep off of where I said something last class about embodying and quote uh, Jung really briefly. He said, we keep, we keep forgetting that we are primates and that we have to make allowances for these primitive layers in our psyche. Without any body, there is no mind and therefore no individuation. And I'm going, to, I'm going to suggest that for me, my Beatrician moment, as I learned more and more about um, the reproductive process between the polarities of egg and sperm, there is, mm. they are so polar in their characteristics, but they belong together, that they spend <laughs> several hours in what is called preconception attraction complex. And during this um, phenomenon that's observable in a petri dish, uh, the egg and the sperm negotiate and the tail of the sperm, what looks like a sunburst on the, on the ovum, starts flagellating and the whole thing starts spinning counterclockwise like a tornado or a cyclone. And that's when they know that conception is potentiated. So what the, the idea of surprise and confusion and um, even chaos, but, but it's, an, it's really not like an explosion. It's, it's the dynamic between two poles that um, but potentiates the conception and there's no penetration. So Beatrice is the primary agent or the egg is the primary agent yeah. because the egg opens, admits one, and then closes. Yeah, beautiful. What a fabulous image, uh, Sheila. Thank you for that. I think identifying this, what we're calling this archetypal Beatrician moment is, I think, very exciting to um, locate one of them, because I think we have many, but there's also the possibility that one's life really took, um, really took a shift from an incident or a condition. And uh, having had a, a couple of uh, uh, pretty serious illnesses and surgeries and recoveries, those changed me. Uh, in ways that I don't want to go into now, but uh, illnesses, um, things that just stop us in our tracks are also part of that Beatrician um, instant in our lives. We have Selena in the audience, Selena Madden, and uh, I think that she would like to ask you something. Please, Selena. Hi, Dennis. Can you hear me? Hi. 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 Well, I was... Um just on this uh the the point that you had made about the ego and the heart's truth and i was writing some comments in the chat saying that i feel like it takes a tremendous amount of honesty and transparency to differentiate between the guide of the ego and the heart's truth yeah. and that the yeah. ego does serve a purpose in um protecting us and um mm -hmm you know, serving that role of providing a sense of security. So it can be hard to, I don't really have a question necessarily, but no, it can, 
Okay, it can be hard to distinguish between the two. So hearing between the heart's truth and, and maybe what the ego is doing to protect you, but that may be preventing a certain amount of growth. Yeah, beautiful, uh, beautiful. And, and, you know, exactly to that point, Selena, I think is what causes so much disorientation and confusion in Dante. Mm. He doesn't have a pat response to this moment of love, of infatuation, of a spiritual awakening, and we could name other things. And I, uh, you give me a way of thinking about how <laughs> the ego has been kind of thrown to the floor of the mat uh, at the moment of, of meeting her, uh, of Dante meeting Beatrice, and then he opens and he'll begin a poem uh, uh, ladies who have intelligence of love, because he knows that the sonnet he wrote needs a particular audience, a particular group of women in Florence whom he knew well, who would get what he was up to. And so the poem begins, uh, um, Ledona, Ledone uh, de Intelletto de Amore, the, you ladies have the intelligence of love. You're the perfect audience for me because you already get it. And now I'm going to read this uh, sonnet uh, to you because his heart has been opened. I'm, I'm using your, I'm, I'm coming back to your language, uh, Selena. And that's, that threshold um, is like the, the threshold sonnet of the 31 that comprise uh, La Vida Nuova. And Dara, to your, to your point, I taught the Divine Comedy for years and never brought in La Vida Nuova. And then one quarter, I thought, you know, I should read that as a little preface. And then it kept taking up more and more time of the seven hours that, uh, well, we had the full class for the Divine Comedy, but it's, it, it, it started to just chew into uh, the class, and I thought, let it, because it's it's the divine comedy writ small, if if I could say it that way. So yeah, I hadn't awakened yet when uh, you took the class uh, <laughs> into no, you 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 need this as part of the organic continuity of of, of the course. So Dante, uh, I'm going to read a little bit, and then um, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, go to a couple of specifics, and I'm watching the clock, and uh, I know I'm going to run out of time, but it's okay. I'd rather run out of time than um, be forcing it. Uh, and as, uh, as part of my myth, I need, uh, part of my myth is that I need excess in order to gain access. And I start the writing myth, mythic writing book with that experience at Pacifica, where I'm pulling, this is when we lived out there, so I could bring a ton of stuff into each class, uh, enough for 14 hours. And, I, I, and I, had, I had you guys for seven. And I was, it was uh, uh, eight in the morning and I was dragging this um, cart, this uh, two-wheeled cart across the parking lot thinking, and I had newspaper articles and magazine stuff and just all kinds of uh, excess baggage, uh, literally and figuratively. And I said, what the hell are you doing? You, you have them for seven hours. You don't have them for seven days. And I can still feel the voice. It came from the right side and it came from behind. And it had three words for me. Excess is access. And I said, thank you very much. That has been a part of my myth, and I never had it articulated. And who articulated it, I still think about. But it relieved me because I need too much in order to gain entryways into the stuff, into the subject matter. And tonight is no uh, exception. So I, I prefer that than, uh, uh, than scarcity. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'll never be a minimalist uh, on any level. So Dante then becomes fully conscious that something has entered him with an energy that is able to change his life's trajectory. And I, 
I don't think I've used that word energy before, but it is, uh, to use uh, Jung's adjective, it's, it's energic, E-N-E-R-G-I-C, that's Jung's word, that, <clears throat> that psyche's transformations happen in part because of energic impulses that it, it, it like floods consciousness and starts evaporating uh, the, the well-laid plans that we have for ourselves. He, Dante writes, this is from Levita Nuova, but I, it's in my notes. Let me say that from that time on, love, and again, it's capital L, uh, and masculine, governed my soul, which became immediately devoted to him, and he reigned over me with such assurance and lordship, given him, this is so important, given him by the power of my imagination. So it's, it's, it's the power of love, but it's as Dante is imagining it. So the, the artfulness, the creativeness is already part of something he is submitting to. And it feels paradoxical, uh, even as I say that aloud that he had no longer any choice but to follow love's guidance. So the, that Beatrician moment contains, and, and this word has been used by some of you, <clears throat> some guiding principle that one, in the fashion of the hero's journey, one must yield to. You remember that's part of Campbell's um, uh, template that once you hear the call and then heed the call, and refusal is always on the horizon as a possibility, then you yield to something bigger than you are. If you yield, Campbell suggests, to something just as big as you are, you're not on the path. It has to have a certain magnitude that takes you over but it's also an act of the will to give yourself over to it. One of the fundamental distinctions between the souls in Inferno and the souls in Purgatorio is that the souls in Inferno, even in the state of souls after death, maintain their willfulness. But the souls in Purgatorio who have had some conversion before they die, are guided by willingness. So the difference between a willful soul and a willing soul is the difference between spending your life in the infernal region and spending your life in a purgatorial and hopeful region, which is communal. The infernal world is isolated. One is isolated. One is isolated by one's own willfulness. You know, we can drop the language of sin in the Catholic Church and talk about acts of the will, to willingly give over your will or willingly hold on to your willfulness. And those create two very different atmospheres uh, in which we live. One can be smitten with such a force of love that it disorients, disorients, disturbs, disassembles, and redistributes one differently in the world. Love then, and I'm, I'm staying with the plot, but I'm, I'm skipping some of the readings from La Vida Nuova in the interest of time. Uh, love then ramps up his presence in the form of a vision that he delivers to Dante while he sleeps. Now, this one we have to look at. I, I, I need to read it from the top to give it a context so that it doesn't feel so um, fractured. After so many days had passed, <coughs> excuse me, that precisely nine years were ending since the appearance. Now, this is Dante now remembering Dante then. And I, I, that distinction... I think uh, John Fricero 
pointed that out in his book on Dante. It just helped me read Dante uh, on a whole other register. The, the now of Dante, the then of Dante. And, and uh, apply it to yourself. Uh, that nine years were ending since the appearance uh, just described of this most gracious lady. It, it happened that on the last one of those days, she appeared dressed in purest white between two ladies of noble bearing, both older than she was. And passing along a certain street, she turned her eyes to where I was standing, faint hearted. And with that indescribable graciousness for which today she's rewarded in the eternal life, she greeted me so miraculously that I seemed at that moment to behold the entire range of possible bliss. I can't help but wonder if Joe Campbell discovered the follow your bliss mantra in his reading of Dante, a poem that he knew. So Beatrice becomes the bliss that Dante follows for the rest of his life. And that's another way of thinking about the Beatrician moment. What bliss is it that um, has captured you or uh, taken you up that you follow? And I, uh, and I want to steal Connie's word, that you yearn for. That's your bliss. It was precisely the ninth hour of that day, three o'clock in the afternoon, when her sweet greeting came to me. Since this was the first time her words had ever been directed to me, I became so ecstatic that like a drunken man, I turned away from everyone and sought the loneliness of my room, where I began thinking of this most gracious lady and thinking of her I fell into a sweet sleep. Now this image of the dream, I wanna to read to you and then I wanna pause. And a marvelous vision appeared to me. I seemed to see a cloud the color of fire and in that cloud, a lordly man, frightening to behold, yet he seemed also to be wondrously filled with joy. Now this is love. He spoke and said many things of which I understood only a few. One was ego, 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 dominus, ruis. I am thy master. I seem to see in his arms. Now this is, here's the image. I seem to see in his arms a sleeping figure, naked, but lightly wrapped in a crimson cloth. Looking intently at this figure, I recognized the lady of the greeting, the lady who earlier in the day had deigned to greet me, Beatrice, on the street of Florence. In one hand, <clears throat> he, love, seemed to be holding something that was all in flames. And it seemed to me that he said these words, vide cor tuum, behold thy heart. And after some time had passed, he seemed to awaken the one who slept, and he forced her cunningly to eat of that burning object in his hand. She ate of it timidly. A short time after this, his happiness gave way to bitterest weeping, the figure of love, and weeping, he folded his arms around this lady, and together they seemed to ascend toward the heavens. At that point, my drowsy sleep could not bear the anguish that I felt. It was broken, and I awoke. At once, I began to reflect, and I discovered that the hour at which that vision had appeared to me was the fourth hour of the night. That is, it was exactly the first of the last hours, the last nine hours of the night. Thinking about what I had seen, I decided to make it known to many of the famous poets of that time. And then just track this, and Will, I, I, this is the passage that uh, hit me strongest, most strongly on your interest of myth and art, because right here, I think they coalesce. 
<clears throat> thinking about what I had seen, I decided to make it known to many of the famous poets of that time. Since just recently I had taught myself the art of writing poetry, I decided to compose a sonnet addressed to all of love's faithful subjects and requesting them to interpret my vision. I would write them what I had seen in my sleep. And then I began to write this sonnet, which begins to every captive soul. And let me read the first stanza of the four or five that, uh, let me just give you a sense of it. To every captive soul and loving heart to whom these words I have composed are sent for your elucidation and reply. <clears throat> Greetings I bring for your sweet Lord's sake, love, capital L. The first three hours, the hours of the time of shining stars, <clears throat> were coming to an end when suddenly love appeared before me. To remember how he really was appalls me. To remember how he really was appalls me. You mean crying by how he really was? That's what's appalling? Yes. Yes. And it also implicates the condition of Beatrice that he brings to her in dream. <clears throat> so she is asked or coaxed or coached by love to eat timidly of Dante's heart. I mean, it's an astonishing moment, and it's the only dream <clears throat> mentioned in uh, the entirety of Lavina Nuova. And you think it's his dream, for a real dream? And it's Dante's real dream, as he tells us. Yeah. Now, I'm interested <clears throat> in any, and I know, you know, there's so much more to say, but that's the image. That's the image that Dante <clears throat> wants us to contemplate. And it is the <clears throat> first sonnet of the 31 that comprise the La Vida Nuova. Uh, instigated by a dream. So, any thoughts? I, I still puzzle over it. And well, part, of me, part of me is not interested in explicating it, but simply sensing it. And another part of me wants to know more. So that's where I am. But one analogy that that dream led me to make is what do you do with the sleeping maiden of love normally it's it's the awakening kiss and in this case it was giving of his own flaming heart yes and this leads to an analogy between love's true kiss and the flaming heart being given to be consumed nice yes any other thoughts and really uh, it's speculate because there's no, uh, I'm going to speak presumptuously here, I don't think there's one, one way that that dream image is to be understood. Now, I will share with you this, um, and I can't remember, maybe it was a dream analysis book that I go back to periodically. Jung says, Jung believes that when when someone is eating in dreams, it is an attempt by the psyche to integrate something that they have not been able to integrate during waking life. But the eating imagery is the psyche's way of assimilating, taking it in, making it part of one's body, Sheila. So for her, for Beatrice to timidly eat of Dante's flaming heart. I mean, Dante's, Dante, if we, if we give it a Jungian reading, Dante is, Dante is trying to integrate something uh, through his dream life that in waking life still disorients him. So he moves from the event in the street to the dream image to crafting a poem that tries to mingle <laughs> both the, the historical event and the imagination of the dream world into a poetic utterance. I mean, it's, 
it's it's the birth of the artist mm -hmm. that we we could say i mean that's one thing i'm not saying that like that's it but it's the awakening of the artist and that image of beatrice timidly eating at his heart is the threshold moment that when dante awakes he feels this poetic urge and he'd already been starting to write poems but suddenly he and again i'm just i'm riffing here and you you come on in and and suddenly he's found his subject matter out of the out of the out of the combination of the dream world and his historical event of this fully embodied beautiful woman you know dennis as you're, you're yeah. talking about that i'm yeah. Um, I'm rereading uh, Joseph Campbell's uh, Mass of God right now. I'm in primitive mythology. And he talks so much about um, in early myth how the, the eating uh, was, was always a way to bring the divine into the body. And I, I, I can't help but see that imagery, you know, in, in, in Beatrice, you know, eating the heart. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, as, as we think about that idea of bringing the divine into uh, our, ourselves, um, and one of the things that Campbell, you know, talks about um, was that the, the God coming into the body or the, the divinity coming into the body through uh, food was always this... Um, it was this sort of messy, gross process. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, you know, I, I just think about that as, as I think of, about Beatrice, you know, eating the heart. It's, it's something that is not meant to make us comfortable. It's an image right. that is disturbing to mm -hmm. evoke us into uh, something that is not just the, the, the pleasantry of what we would hope dream life often, you know, would be. Um, so I, I, I'm struck at the the horror and the gore of the image being necessary to the divine experience. Yeah, beautiful. And of course, it's resonating the central myth of Western Europe in the Middle Ages, and that is the the Catholic Church and the Mass and the uh, eating of the body and drinking of the blood of Christ, and the Church is. Um, uh, adamant that uh, it's not, I mean, this is tough, but uh, it's, it's, it's not symbolic. It's, it's your, the, the consecrated host is the body of Christ, not represents it. And that's a, that's a tough one to take in. I mean, uh, and the, and the wine is the blood. So that, I mean, it's so primal and it's about ingesting and making part of your metabolism divinity. Could I just add something from a reproductive place again? Yeah, Sheila. Yeah. Um, the, there's a, a cap on the head of each sperm that has to, the one that makes it and is received into um, the egg, this cap, uh, it, think of uh, off, with his, off with his head, the uh, queen of hearts, off with his head. They lose this, and then the nucleus, uh, the sperm is almost all nucleus, and the egg is almost all cytoplasm. When it goes in, think of the nucleus as the center or the heart of the cell, of, and, and there is a me right. metabolic um, consumption, mutual, <laughs> breaking apart, individuating, wow. differentiating, you know, and yep. to make a third thing. Yes, beautiful. To make a third thing, to yeah, make a third the, thing. the yeah. tertium quid. That's it, right? right. And that's right. the transcendent. Function. It is more yeah, than beautiful. it is more than um, a synthesis because they they have yes. to negotiate and hold the tension of those opposites. Yeah, for for a um, for the complete turning of the Trinity for a fourth to come out of it. That's it. Yeah, and beautiful. Like, uh, like Harry Potter, the Philosopher's Stone, the Philosopher's Stone can only be born uh, with the death of the two parents into the Philosopher's Stone is one of the things they say. 
which of yes. course is how Harry Potter, Harry, how Harry Potter was written uh, as a personification of the Philosopher's Stone. There's, there's one other uh, structural thing that I can't help but recognize. Uh, Beatrice no. is always treated as his guide and she's his guide to love. And so here in his dream, if the deal is he needs to integrate love, he needs to integrate what the heart represents as love, it's not just her eating, you know, it's heart. Like you say, it's him eating the heart through her. So there she is again in the very beginning, guiding him to his own relationship with love. Yeah, that's really nice. And you, you tripwire something in me uh, and, that, that, and Dante scholars are, you know, all wanting to say, and, and I think with a lot of correctness, that she is the emblem she is the feminine Christ who is a mediator between the human world and the divine world. I mean, it, it really becomes richly complex and mysterious and sacred and embodied and, yeah. So Dante's, Dante's rewriting the New Testament in part, uh, more in the Divine Comedy, but, but he's, he's really taking scripture on as Melville does in Moby Dick, and it's, it's like pushing scripture forward instead of just backing into it and saying, here's what's, here's what's in the book. Yeah, but you get these uh, courageous uh, poets and artists and uh, sculptors and painters who say, well, let's, let's uh, lean on it a little bit and see where, it, see where we can take it beyond then it's organic, then it's a living myth. But if it's just something rote and ideologically um, uh, um, fixed, it, there's no life in it. It's already been assassinated, uh, which is always the danger of uh, literalism around anything, but especially scripture. We have Tiffany who has uh, been hanging out there with her hand up. No worries. So what I had written in chat earlier, because um, you had said something about the line between metaphysics and myth being very thin. And I find that to be so true because the more that I try to intellectualize a myth, I feel like the further I, w I get away from it. And I need to understand it from my heart and not from my mind. I'm yes. actually working on a project. It's an adaptation of a living myth, and no one has been able to, um, people have tried to adapt it before for the screen and it hasn't worked. And so I'm working on this project that I thought, oh, this is gonna be so easy, but I have to bring in the magic and the mystery into it. And yes. it's, it's yes. been so challenging, but I'm like, okay, I can't just intellectualize it. I spent all this time intellectualizing it, and now I'm like, no, I, I can't do this. And so I'm just wondering no. if you kind of speak to that. So uh, is working with Deborah Ann Quibell and Je uh, Jennifer Selig on this uh, a Deep Creativity, Seven Ways to Spark Your Creative Spirit. And boy, you know, there were seven chapters and each of us wrote an essay per chapter and then Deborah wrote a breathing in piece and then a breathing out piece at the beginning and ending of each of the seven uh, sections. But boy, did we each come to the danger of getting too cognitive and too heady around creativity and what a way to suffocate that wonderful juice that flows when one is given over, gives oneself up to that creative process and then is willing to be just taken in the flow of it. And the as soon as one becomes intellectual and too heavily reflective, um, it loses all the mystery. So and I, I, Dante comes to that. I, I want to credit him. I, I was just hoping before we ended, and I may not be able to, but this, um, is it 32? Yeah. I, let, let me end with this because this is, the, this is the, one of those threshold moments in the, in the uh, La Vida Nuova. And his audience is this group of women 
Here's what Dante says at the beginning, and then I'll, I'll just read the first stanza of it because of uh, uh, wanting to be respectful of time. Then it happened, and this is on page 32, just for the sake of interest. Then it happened that while walking down a path along which ran a very clear stream, uh, which is the um, river that Dante is baptized in Purgatorio, I suddenly felt a great desire to write a poem. And I began to think how I would go about it. Now, of course, in creativity, there's a craft, but then there's also that moment of inspiration. And the balancing of those two is, uh, I think, um, a challenge for all of us. It seemed to me to, that to speak of my lady would not be becoming unless I were to address my words to, words to ladies, and not just to any ladies, but only to those who are worthy, not, not merely to women. Then I must tell you, my tongue, as if moved of its own accord, spoke and said, ladies who have intelligence of love. With great delight, I decided to keep these words in mind and to use them as the beginning of my poem. Later, after returning to the aforementioned city and, re and reflecting for several days, I began writing a canzone. Using this beginning, and I constructed it in the way that will appear below in its division. The canzone begins, ladies who have intelligence of love. I wish to speak to you about my lady. And this is part of, you know, the creative process that I think is given the shortest shrift. Who is the audience we're creating for? Uh, addressing. Uh, 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 crafting something. You know, who's the audience? Now, Walter Ong, one of the great rhetoricians, is a Jesuit priest and a rhetorician that studied under McLuhan at University of Toronto and wrote uh, several books on rhetoric, but he wrote an article, the title of which I think you'll find rather fascinating. The, the title of the essay is The Writer's Audience is Always a Fiction. We have to fictionalize who it is out there. And then write to that, because that's, the that's the third of the tripod of, of rhetoric, uh, subject matter, the language used to deliver it, and the audience to whom it's delivered. And that's the part that gets shortchanged. Dante, knowing Aristotle's rhetoric inside and out, really pays attention to who his audience is, which I have to be kind of reminding myself of that when I write. But let me just finish here. Um, uh, ladies who have intelligence of love, I wish to speak to you about my lady, not thinking to complete her litany, but to talk in order to relieve my heart, which is, it's overflowing, it's ready to burst. I tell you, when I think of her perfection, love lets me feel the sweetness of his presence. So the thing we haven't mentioned at all, or I haven't, is the, is the uh, conjunctio of the masculine and the feminine with the masculine love, capital L, and, and Beatrice. And if at that point I could still feel bold, my words would make all of mankind fall in love. If I could pull that off, uh, and of course, as a as a, a medieval poet uh, uh, challenging the tradition, Dante's looking for fame. It's just it's just part of it. All right, let me finish. I do not want to choose a tone too lofty, for fear that such ambition make me timid. Instead, I shall discuss her graciousness, defectively, to measure by her merit with you ladies and maidens whom love knows, for such a theme is only fit for you. And then he goes on for four other magnificent uh, stanzas. So the inspiration part, but then the crafting. How do you craft it without bleeding it to death by overly um, uh, thinking it? Yeah. And I think there, oh yeah. I think there I should end. I, I'm deeply appreciative that you hang with us during this process. And I 
Oh, I want to go back to pleasure. I want to go back to Moby Dick for one second because we found our way today by abandoning the script that we came in with at a certain point. And so the, the real oh. joy in, in ending up where we did is allowing ourselves to all participate in this process of self-discovery. Yes. And, and you, have been, you have been the guide for us, as you have been for so many classes that we all took from you. Thank so, you. You know. A pleasure. With that, let me just bring it to a close. This has been the second of, of the talks that we're doing with Dr. Dennis Slattery. And uh, we think there's going to be three more. And um, we'll see how he does with this, you know, and how the coronavirus <laughs> is doing down in Texas. Oh. So it's a strange time for all of us. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the internet has been a, a wonderful cauldron for all of us to process our feelings and content and deepen our relationship with one another. And so, you know, I, I, I thank my good friend and partner in this, Will Lynn, and yes. I thank Sarah and John and Kwame, you yes. know. Beautiful, generous, hey, you're all so generous. This is just a, a beautiful experience that shows what happens when you just show up and, you know, um, here we all are. I mean, yes. this, this is beautiful. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it and I'm looking forward to seeing, well, I wish I could see all of you, but uh, having you all at the third one and I, I never take it for granted, uh, the time that you all have given and then the engaging with the material. It's just, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. So thank you all. And thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending. Until next time. Good. See you in two weeks.